check, 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 Awesome. You guys have worked so hard on your test this week, and that is exciting. Thank you for all your hard work, and now we get to celebrate with a little bit of fun. Are you guys ready for some fun? Yes, I'm ready for some fun. Well, to begin our time today, we have a really awesome game that we are going to play. Do you guys like games? I love games. I love games, and this game is called the king says do you like my crown <clears throat> my daughter made it for me last night joy made it yes all right in the most amazing game of all time king says i am the king and whatever i say as the king you have to do okay now here's where things get tricky when the king says to do it you have to do it right away but things get a little tricky when I take off my hat or my crown because I'm still going to say king says and if you do what the king says when he's not wearing his crown whoop, you're out okay so I'm just saying you gotta pay attention now uh, I do have some prizes for some winners if we got a winner if we don't have a winner I'll give them to each of your teachers and whoever, uh, I don't know, you can decide, teachers, whoever you want to give it to later on in the day. How about the teachers get it? Yeah, I like that. All right, you guys ready here? Are you guys ready online? Let's play some King Says. Stand up. All right. R ready? The King Says, pat your head and rub your tummy. The king says, pat your head and rub your tummy. The king says, stop. The king says, crawl on the floor like a little baby. Crawl on the floor like a little baby. The king says, crawl on the floor like a little baby. The king says, crawl on the floor like a little baby. The king says, pretend to climb a ladder. The king says, pretend to climb a ladder. The, sink, the king says, be a pair of scissors. Be a pair of scissors. Be a pair of scissors. <laughs> the king says, walk on your knees. The king says, walk on your knees. <laughs> Oh, got some people out. If you walked on your knees, you are out. All right. The king says, smell your armpit. The king says, smell your armpit. Is it fresh? I don't know. The king says, wink with your left eye. The king says, wink with your left eye. The king says, wink with your left eye. Wonderful. The king says, act like a monkey. The king says, act like a monkey. The king says, yawn. Oh, yawn. Oh, if you yawn, you're out. Anybody out? Okay. The king says, walk backwards around the room. The king says, walk backwards. Oh, you're out, Kimmy! The king says, walk backwards around the room. The king says, walk backwards around the room. Ooh, no, you're out. Oh, uh, the king says, keep walking backwards around the room, but don't run into anybody. The king says, touch your nose with your tummy. The king says, touch your nose with your tummy. The king says, touch your nose with your tummy. The king says, touch your nose with your tummy. Okay, stop walking backwards. The king says, stop walking backwards. Oh, my goodness. All right, the king says, return back to your spots. The king says, return back to your spots. All right, the king says, smell your feet. The king says, smell your feet. Oh, boy. Oh, wow, if that is rank. The king says, give a big yawn. Ooh, if you gave a big yawn, you're out. Who's left? Who's left? Stand up. The king says, stand up if you're out. All right. We're going to finish our game of the king says, stand up. Oh, stand up if you're still in. Sorry. The king says, stand up if you're still in. All right. Very good. We're going to end it with some rock, paper, scissors. Find a person around you. And we're going to go with a rock, paper, scissors championship. Ready? Find a partner. Here we go. First one out. Okay. Ready? One, two, three, go. Find another person. Find another person. If you're out, sit down. 
Find another person if you're out, sit down. Find another person if you're out, sit down. <laughs> oh, man, it's getting dangerous. Oh, Jackson's up here. Okay, ready? One, two. Here we go. Okay. Oh, my goodness, Nathan and Jordan. Oh, Jordan Parker. Wow. That's impressive. I'll still give. Here you go, buddy. There you go. All right. And then Mrs. Kalmus, here you go. Someone for your class. Wonderful. All right, guys. Let's stand up. Stand up. Just to remember to all our classes online, guys, when you come in here to chapel, which you will here before the end of the year, we'll have some fun games. We'll have some prizes for you guys as well. So we're just thankful that we can be together here live in person in chapel and have chapel in our classrooms. It's been a real big blessing to be able to be uh, worshiping together. Well, uh, now is the point in time in our chapel where you guys are going to say your verse. So I would like one person from each class uh, to come up and then lead your verse. Okay, so Berkeley and Cammie, why don't you girls come on up here, okay? Awesome. And they're going to say their verse. And then to our classes online, as soon as they're finished saying their verse, we'll pause and you guys can say your verse. All right, you guys ready? Okay, what's your verse this week? Philemon 4 and 5. Philemon 4 and 5. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of your faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Philemon 4 and 5. Awesome. Praise God, Cornerstone. I love that verse. Let's press. Uh, well, you don't have to press pause anymore. Just go ahead and stand <laughs> up and you guys can say your verse. Give you guys a few more seconds in your own classrooms. All right. Good morning, fourth grade. How come Mr. Parker's was more energetic? You're like, good morning, Mr. Man. Good morning, fourth grade. That. So I like chapel. And good morning to the rest of you lower school. Let's all where we are stand and let's praise our God together this morning. Here we go. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you move, I'll move. I will follow. Here we go. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight, high above my life. I will trust in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow whom you love, I love, how you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you, yeah, I will follow you, yeah. Light into the world, light into my life, I will live for you're the one I seek, knowing I will find all I need in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you, whom you love, I love. How you serve, I'll serve. 
If this life I lose, I will follow you. In you there's joy, unending joy. And I will follow where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. guys pray with me? God, thank you so much for another Friday that we get to gather as your uh, children and celebrate and praise your name. Uh, God, as we get to hear this message now, would you just uh, open our ears uh, to what you have to say to each and every one of us this morning? God, we love you and we thank you. It's your son's name I pray. Amen. Well, you guys can have a seat in here and in your classrooms you can have a seat. Let's now take a look at the next chapter in our Jesus Storybook Bible. Jesus' friends were afraid, so they were hiding in an upstairs room with the door bolted shut. But that didn't stop Jesus. He just walked straight through the wall. It's a ghost! Thomas screamed and hid under the table. But it wasn't a ghost. I'm hungry, Jesus said. What's for lunch? Peter gave him a fish. They all hung back and watched him eat it. This can't be, they were telling themselves. It's impossible. It's not happening. But it was right in front of them. Mmm, delicious. Jesus wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and grinned. Can a ghost do that? He winked, and then they all laughed. I'm really here, Jesus said, and he really was. Peter's heart leapt with joy, and he fell into Jesus' arms, hugging and kissing him. The others followed. They felt their hearts would burst from the happiness. The friends ate together and chatted happily, and every now and then they'd just gaze at Jesus and have to touch him to be sure they weren't dreaming. Jesus had a real body, but this body was better. It had come through death and couldn't get sick or be killed again. This body would live forever. Jesus had come back with a brand new body. Not only were sad things coming untrue, the friends realized, they were becoming new again. Was God going to make everything new? Jesus said, I am the Savior and the Rescuer of the world. And they knew, because he couldn't stay dead, because Jesus had come alive again, that somehow everything would be all right. A few days later, as they walked together, Jesus told his friends, It's time for me to go home to my father. They all looked worried. And then they remembered what Jesus had told them before he died. There's a place for you. I'll get it ready, Jesus had said. You know the way. Thomas had panicked. I don't know the way to get there. Yes, you do, Jesus had said. I am the way, and the truth, and the life. When at last they reached the top of the highest hill near Jerusalem, Jesus turned to them and said, Go everywhere and tell everyone the happy news. Tell them I love them so much that I died for them. It's the truth that overcomes the terrible lie. God loves his children. Yes. He really does. Suddenly, the whole sky 
was filled with a dazzling light. Now everyone can come home to God, Jesus said. Death is not the end of you. You can live forever with your Father in heaven because I have rescued the whole world. And something amazing happened. Jesus rose up into the bright air higher and higher. They shaded their eyes and watched him go until a cloud hid Jesus so they couldn't see him any more. They stood looking up into the sky like that for a long time. Suddenly, two shining men appeared. What are you doing? they asked. Jesus has gone up to heaven, but one day he will come back in the same way you saw him leave, from heaven and from the sky. Jesus' friends went back to Jerusalem with a strange gladness inside their hearts and with something Jesus said that stuck in their minds. Even though you won't be able to see me anymore, I will never leave you. No, not ever. I will be with you. Yes, always and forever. How can Jesus be with us and leave us at the same time, they wondered. They didn't understand. No, but soon they would. Wow. Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. He is alive. And last week we talked all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how that one event changed the entire world. Well, if you were a disciple of Jesus and you were sitting in that room before he came back from the dead and you were wondering what on earth is happening, how would you feel? You just watched Jesus be killed. How do you think those disciples felt? Grace? Sad. Yes. What else do you think they were feeling? Yeah. Mad. Yeah, Haley. Right, yep. Did Jesus just leave us? Was this all for nothing? Tatum. Yeah, scared. As we saw in our video today, they were locked in a room. They were afraid for their lives. But then, all of a sudden, Jesus comes into the room. How amazing would that have been? Well, in that moment, I think there was one disciple who was maybe feeling a little extra sad, a little extra mad, and a little extra frustrated. Do you think, I wonder if you guys know which disciple I'm thinking about. Yep. Peter, that's exactly right. What do we know about the life of Peter that happened the night before Jesus went to the cross? Hold on. That's right. Jesus is having a meal with the disciples, and he's telling them, guys, this is it. Tomorrow, I am going to die. And Peter's like, no way, Jesus, you're not going to die. And he said, yes, I'm going to die. And actually, all of you guys, all my disciples, you're going to turn away and abandon me. And Peter's like, no way, Jesus, even if I have to die, I will never leave you. And Jesus says, actually, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. He's like, never, Jesus. That will never happen. Well, we know what happens because we can read about this in Matthew chapter 26. And in that chapter, we see what happens to Peter. Jesus is arrested in the garden. He's taken to Caiaphas' house, and he's put on trial. Now, here's what Scripture tells us. It tells us that while Jesus is in Caiaphas' house, in the middle of a night, in an illegal trial, there were a whole bunch of people who were gathering outside in a courtyard. Peter was one of those people. And do you remember what happened? All of the people are gathering around. They're talking about, oh, Jesus, he's in Caiaphas' house. He's on trial. What's going to happen? And Peter's there, and he's warming his hands by the fire. And some people come up to him. Hey, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? No, no, no way. And a little girl comes up. She says, yes, I recognize you from your accent. No, no, I don't know him. 
And then the third time, someone comes up to him and says, yes, you're a man from Galilee. You're with Jesus. And Peter's finally like, no, I don't know him. And as soon as he said that, what did he hear? And I have to wonder in that moment, if right after Peter said that, if maybe there was a window into Caiaphas's house. And I wonder if as soon as those words came out of his mouth, if Jesus looked right through the window, right out to Peter. Oh. Can you imagine how awful that would have felt in that moment? It, it, it must have been just like one of the most terrible feelings in the entire world. Have you ever hurt somebody or maybe said something, and as soon as those words came out of your mouth or you did that thing, you were like, oh, I can't believe I did that. Times that by a million, <laughs> and I bet you know how Peter felt. You know, uh, what we find through this passage is that Peter denied Jesus. He, he sinned. He, he denied his very best friend. And that feeling that we get when we've maybe done something similar, when we've sinned, that's called grief and guilt. Have you ever heard those words before? Grief and guilt. And the Bible actually talks a lot about grief and guilt. And in that moment, Peter was experiencing these things. Uh, here's what guilt is. Guilt is that yucky feeling inside of you as soon as you do something you know is wrong. You ever been there? You're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, that was wrong. Ooh, I sinned. Been there? I've been there. It's okay. We're, we, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know how that feels, right? But let me tell you this, that guilt is actually a gift from God. He makes us feel sad and yucky on the inside when we sin so that we turn to Jesus and ask for forgiveness and ask for help to follow him. If we didn't have guilt, if we didn't feel bad after we sinned, we wouldn't need a savior. God gives us guilt. He makes us feel yucky even though we don't like it so that we turn to Jesus. Now, uh, grief is the partner of guilt. It comes along with guilt and Grief is a deep, deep sorrow and sadness that accompanies your guilt, right? So you do something bad, right? Mom says, don't do this thing, and you do it anyway, and you're like, oh, man, I shouldn't have done that. But then comes the grief. Oh, when you actually stop to think about your actions, the grief is that deep sadness that comes along with it. You see, the Bible says that God allows us to feel guilt and grief when we know we've sinned so that we turn to Jesus and ask for help. Godly grief is something that the Bible says is a good thing. But then there's another kind of grief called worldly grief, and I want to tell you about those two things. There's a good kind of sadness that comes along with our guilt after we've sinned. And that's called godly grief. Godly grief knows that my sin is hurting God and it's hurting me and it may have even hurt someone else. That's godly grief. Because what happens after you sin is you say, oh Lord, I am a sinner. My sin hurts you. It hurts me and I've even hurt someone else maybe, will you please forgive me? You see, godly grief puts you or leads you to a place where you're like, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Please forgive me. Help me follow you, Jesus. Now, godly grief is always followed up by two things, okay? It's followed up by, number one, confession. You guys know what confession is, right? When we pray, we confess, and that word confession just means to say what God already knows. You know, sometimes we think when we sin that we won't get found out, but guess what? God already knows. He already knows. He sees everything. And so when we confess our sin, we're saying, 
something that God already knows. It's like, oh, Lord, you saw what I did. I am so sorry. But then the second part is forgiveness. Will you please forgive me? Where we ask for forgiveness of our sin. And then the action step with godly grief is, okay, I'm not going to go back there. I'm not going to disobey mom and dad anymore. God, please help me walk in your strength and live for Jesus. That's godly grief. Now, uh, the bad kind of grief is called worldly grief. And worldly grief, it's not good at all. So you sin, and let's just say, let's just put a scenario on the table, literally. Uh, Mom makes a delicious apple pie. Like, there is smoke rising from this pie. The crust is buttery and delicious, and the inside are fresh, honey crisp apples. Come on. Is your mouth watering? Mine is watering. I want some apple pie. And mom says, that apple pie, that's for the neighbors. And you're like, oh, man, it smells so good. And so then you... Look around. Mom's not here. I can take a little piece. No one's going to notice. And as you maybe take a spoonful and you're putting it in your mouth, Mom bursts in the door. What are you doing? (sighs) Now, godly grief would look at this scenario and say, Mom, you're right. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And mom would say, you need to go talk to Jesus, (laughs) right? And then you go and you talk to Jesus and you're like, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I'm so sorry. Please help me obey you. That's godly grief. But if you have worldly grief, mom bursts in. She says, what are you doing? And you're like, I'm eating the apple pie. She's like, you need to go talk to Jesus. And instead you go up to your room and you play video games. You don't ask for forgiveness, and actually, deep down inside, you don't think what you did was wrong. You ever been there? I've been there. You see, worldly grief looks at your sin, and instead of being sorry for hurting God, you're just sorry you got caught. You see, God wants us to walk and have godly grief because of what Jesus did on the cross. You see, that night in the courtyard, Jesus and Peter were both on trial. Did you ever think about that? Jesus is on trial, but so is Peter. Jesus had told Peter that you're going to sin. You're going to turn away from me. You're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, yeah, right. I'm not going to do that. But then the rooster crows and boom, like a three million pound weight hits his heart, and sinks him to the ground. Now, the worst part about this scenario and the worst part about this event for Peter was as soon as this is done, I can't imagine, he must have cried, just ran off and cried. And then the worst part of that is is he actually had to watch his Savior be killed on a cross. You see, when we sin, we have an opportunity to make things right with God and make things right with whoever that we've hurt. But Peter didn't have that opportunity. Can you imagine how much worse that would have been to know that you denied Jesus, you walked away, you abandoned him, and then he died and you couldn't tell him you were sorry? <sighs> well, that was the scenario for Peter. Peter. As awful as that must have felt, it led Peter to a place where he was able to get face-to-face with Jesus when he rose from the dead. Now, in John chapter 21, we see what happens. Uh, The disciples, they haven't seen Jesus. They're in a boat. And uh, you got to know, like, if you've ever walked around with unconfessed sin in your heart that just feels yucky you know you did something wrong you haven't made it right and you know you need to oh anybody been there i've been there so here they are in a boat fishing and then all of a sudden 
Peter. What? Is that Jesus? It was Jesus. Jesus was alive. He'd risen from the dead, and he's called out to the disciples while they're fishing. If you are Peter, this is your chance. Boom, and that's exactly what we see. Peter throws off his robe. He does a nosedive into the water, swims to the shore, and there on the shore was Jesus, his very best friend. And you know what Jesus had done? He'd made him a meal. He'd prepared a little campfire on the beach, and he had some fish and some breakfast for the disciples that he had prepared. Oh, guys, when I get home, I love to do, like, wrestling or, like, bear hugs. Can you imagine the bear hug that Peter gave Jesus in that moment? Like, it just must have been, like, tackling Jesus. I don't know, but I imagine maybe that's what Peter did. Well, as they're sitting around and they're having the campfire and they're eating, they're like, tell us, what, how did all this happen? And Jesus explained to them, you know, there's a moment in the conversation where things get quiet. And Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. And he's like, Peter, do you love me? Y- yeah, Jesus, I love you. Peter, do you love me? absolutely, Lord, I love you. Do you see what Jesus was doing there? How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus ask Peter if he loved him? Three times. Do you know what he was doing? He was restoring Peter. He knew how bad he felt on the inside. He knew that weight of sin Because he had carried it himself. But he had risen from the dead so that he could restore Peter. You see, what Jesus accomplished in his life, death, and resurrection was what we need in those moments of our weakness when we turn away from God and we do our own thing. That's why Jesus lived and died and rose again in our place. We're for moments like that. Because here's the reality. Jesus designed you to be close to him. Let's say that out loud together. Even if you're in your classroom, Jesus wants me to be close to him. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus wants me to be close to him. Amen. He designed you to live in a super close relationship with him. But when there's sin in that relationship, it kind of distances you. Right? Think about maybe when you've hurt somebody, how close to them do you feel in that moment? Super close? No. And so what happens is that Jesus gives us this gift. And sometimes that gift, it feels yucky. It's the guilt and it's the grief. But what he offers us is forgiveness. Let's say that together. One, two, three, forgiveness. One, two, three, forgiveness. Jesus wants to forgive you. Now, a year ago, I had an opportunity to travel to Israel and to stand on the very beach where Jesus made that little charcoal breakfast. I've got a picture up here I want to show you. That's it. Right there on the Sea of Galilee. That's the exact spot that historians think that that took place. And when I was there, I reached down into the water and I pulled out some rocks because I knew what happened on that beach that day. And I took home some rocks from that beach because when I look at them, they remind me that Jesus lived the perfect life that I could never live, and he died the death that I deserve when he went to the cross. But not only that, he rose again so that I could be forgiven if I place my hope, my trust in him, and I live as one of his followers. I have forgiveness. I want to show you these rocks and you can pass them around. There you go. And I'll bring it over here. And you can pass that rock around. And as you're passing that rock around, I want you to look at it. Because what it stands for is the forgiveness of sin and the restoration of a super tight and close relationship with Jesus. Jesus knew at some point you'd be like Peter. 
that you'd mess up, that you would sin. But what he offers to you is what that rock stands for. It's forgiveness of your sin. Psalm 103 says that Jesus has removed your sin as far as the east is from the west. That's a really big distance. It says it's buried in an ocean of forgetfulness. It's forgotten. It's gone. That rock, when you hold it, when you look at it, it came from that same beach where Jesus restored Peter. And Jesus wants to restore you. So as we end today, I want to offer you guys an invitation to be forgiven. If you need Jesus, if you don't have Jesus as your Savior, this could be an opportunity. You need to talk to your teacher. You need a relationship with Jesus. If you haven't done that, you need to. But here's my question. In a room like this with lots of fourth graders and in a school with the rest of all the classrooms watching and participating with us, there's got to be somebody out there who's holding on to some sin. There's got to be somebody out there who's maybe felt like Peter, who they're walking around with that weight of guilt and grief, and they feel terrible on the inside. Jesus does not want you to feel terrible. He wants to offer you forgiveness. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to teach you guys Apology 101, Forgiveness 101. It goes like this. It says, I'm sorry I did blank. Step two, I was wrong. Step three, will you please forgive me? Step four, help me live for you. And so to end our time together, if you have been holding on to sin, I want you to put it in the arms of Jesus because he forgave it. He lived and died and rose again in your place so that you could be forgiven of your sin. And when we confess our sin, 1 John tells us this, that he forgives us of that sin and he restores that super intimate, close friendship relationship with Jesus. So here's how this is going to work. I'm going to pray. I'll say a line in the prayer and you can simply say it back. Okay? All right. Let's go ahead and pray. Jesus, thank you for this picture of forgiveness. Thank you that on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, you restored Peter. God, you want to restore us as well. And so if there's anyone who's been holding on to sin, anyone who's been walking the wrong direction, anyone who needs to confess that sin in your presence and then maybe make it right with someone else, God, we want to offer that opportunity. And so if that's you today, I just offer, uh, just go ahead and repeat after me. Here we go. God, I'm sorry I did blank. And then fill in the blank. I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Thank you that you made me to be close to you. Thank you, Jesus, for living a perfect life in my place. Will you help me live close to you? Help me turn away from temptation and trust in Jesus. If I've hurt someone, help me make it right. Thank you for your forgiveness, Jesus. I love you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer in faith, clean. It's awesome. Well, guys, it's been awesome to worship with you here this morning. I hope you have a fantastic day. I hope your last tests are awesome and you rock them out and you have a fantastic Friday. All right. Well, go ahead. Let's stand up and you guys are dismissed. Have an amazing Friday. Bye, guys. Thank you.